Guess what, TG? It's 4chan's birthday, so I got you a present. A month and a half on hiatus due to uni starting up again. It's read for the discussion of fables concerning Shadow Run with complimentary argumentation the 17th. This is going to be a quick one because I'm running a Pathfinder game in 2 hours. But that also means I wrote it all up in advance this time. No waiting. No mercy. This particular run was Dervish's time to shine. So I'm hoping that all of you Dervish fans will get your fix today. Thread for the discussion of fables concerning Shadow Run with complimentary argumentation the 17th. Also, Anon, never let it be said that I don't fulfill my promises. There you have it, said the out of town fixer, as Brianna McCreary, Bent, Wildcard, Lock, and Dervish eyed the purchase. It's got two Gatling guns, a bank of missiles, cots and rations for a full squad, military grade armor plating, lock on and emp countermeasures and an emergency eject that deploys away from the rotors. Wildcard whistled loudly. Only used by a little old red samurai squad on Sundays. A. Hey, Mitsuhama. Actually, commented the fixer, and then one of my prime running teams. A hound ain't much of a stealth craft, though, and they've been doing runs across the border in Denver. So we've been in talks and they'll upgrade to a T-bird as soon as they can offload this attack chopper. You interested in buying? Wildcard nodded emphatically, but Dervish and Ben glared him down. Locke responded. That depends on if the price is right. It's a nice helicopter, but we're in the market to protect ourselves, hypothetically, from an Aztec attack squadron, and a gunship it isn't. Full price I'm expecting all paid as 250,000, but I assume you're not paying it all up front. Locke got a quick okay from the rest of the team over the subvocals, and then responded. We can handle the 50 right now, and then we'll do the rest in down payments. The fixer frowned and examined his nails. He was a barrel-chested African-American human in a nice suit and shades, and cultivated an intentional air of aloofness despite the nicomically illegal transaction that was taking place. I need some incentive for you to pay up quickly, otherwise my team isn't getting their T-bird. I'll accept that if I get to charge 10% interest every month until the full price is paid off. Locke rebounded, done, but you only get the interest off whatever's left in the payment, so if we pay it off early, the interest goes down. The fixer nodded slowly. That's agreeable. You have a deal. Brianna, I'm expecting my fee. McCreary reached into the pocket of her smart pants suit and produced a cred stick. Thanks for putting us at the front of the line, Diamond. Anything for a fellow fixer. You boys treat this bird right. Oh, and the hangar doesn't come with, so I'm expecting you out in 24 hours. Wildcard grin, don't worry. I'm itching to take this lass for a fly anyhow, as the team arced over the skies of Auburn and then rode the smoky updrafts of Puyallup, keeping out of range of any of the megacorp's greedy eyes. Wildcard quizzed the team, his eyes twitched in his head as he interfaced with the helicopters moved by wire override, but he maintained enough cogency to talk. Smooth ride? Everyone else on the team grunted their approval. Familiarize yourselves with the guns? Dervish put up a thumbs up from the Minigun's control console. Short up a couple of cars as we passed over the scrap heap. Was wondering what that was. That just brings us to the most important question. The team looked expectantly at Wildcard. Where the hell do we park this thing? Jose Rodriguez, the blind, elderly orc gladiator come freedom fighter known to his young protege and said protege's running team as sensei was mildly jarred by the loud fuoka fuoka coming from the roof of his crumbling baron's abode, dock wagon, the news, and the cops tended to stay out of Redmond, which meant that the helicopter he guessed to be approximately 20 meters above his humble home and lowering fast was corp, privately owned, or merc. He leapt to the reasonable assumption that as technology had found him again, latched up his ceramic ballistic armor, ran a quick diagnostics check on his cyber blades. Tossed a grenade belt over his shoulder, and made for the roof, as Sensei spotted the Eagle Warrior on the rooftop, gesturing for the large combat chopper to land, he knew that his hunch was right. His sight was failing, but his sonar scan would pick up the distinctive balance fins on the armor anywhere. He crept in, knowing he'd only have one chance for the kill. I've got you now Mithurfikas. As Sensei leapt from the rubble, the Eagle Warrior responded with astonishing speed and fluidity, his improved reflexes spell in full tilt. Sensei ducked and dodged towards his enemy while the Aztec yelped in surprise, shooting gouts of smoldering ash at his assailant. Sensei landed atop the Eagle Warrior with a laugh, deploying both of his elbow cyber blades. However, to his surprise, the Eagle Warrior shouted, I won't let you take me alive, Aztec. 
Sensei stopped an inch short of punching both blades through the Aztec's faceplate. Hey, kid, that was my line. Dervish stepped off the helicopter, looking sidelong at Sensei and Locke as he finished a fast food hoagie. Hey, Mexicans. Sure. Locke adjusted the hermetic seal on his beak-like helmet and glared at Dervish. Who the fuck is this? Dad, meet Locke. Locke, meet Dad. I can see the resemblance. As Locke sculpted back into the helicopter, Sensei stood up and brushed himself off, retracting his cyber blades. Where are the clown and the hippie? They in the chopper? Dervish beamed. Yep. We were thinking about parking it here when it's not in use, since no corp is going to go searching in the barrens. Sensei grimaced at Dervish. Son, you can think all you want, but that's not going to stop every 2-bit hood, man-eating monster, and radioactive mutant and redmond from gunning for the combat chopper on my roof. Wildcard stepped out of the back of the helicopter, holding large sacks of cement under his arms. We were also thinking we'd set up a concrete perimeter with an electric fence and a lumber and camo netting facade over the helipad. Maybe a few attack drones for good measure. Locke added. We're also going to set up a ward and a few spirit patrols. Sensei pointed at Wildcard. No cost to me? I'm footing the bill personally. Sensei leaned over and put his arm over Devish's red, white and blue shoulders. Enjoy your new parking spot, son. It was late in December, 2073, and with the notable exception of Dervish, who was now living with Sensei in their fortress compound built around a decaying office building, the entire team had taken the compromise of their identities and living spaces during the Universal Omnitech run to be an omen that it was time to upgrade their living quarters. Wildcard had moved into a Finnegan mob suburb in Renton, paying off his unassuming white picket fence and backyard pool with periodically helping his repugnant landlord, Mrs. O'Malley, to rough up the local debtors. He also started spending money on real food, at least until Locke started coming over to mooch off of him. He then promptly stopped. Bend moved to a Puyallup neo-shamanic Buddhist fusion post-capitalist organic co-op, sharing the space with dozens of other young ideologues. Of course, Bend himself was well into his 50s, but the point was that he was young at heart, wasn't it? He found himself pleased with the busy work that distracted him from his criminal lifestyle, such as maintaining the gardens and refueling the hybrid biodiesel and used vegetable oil generator in the basement. Locke's door roof finally collapsed, dropping the devil rat nest on the floor above into his bolt hole. He proceeded to move to the other bombed out ruin next door, but not before clearing out a nest of feral ghouls and a sludge spirit. The team sat in their usual seats in Brianna McCreary's office as their fixer, wearing one of her better skirt suits, hung up festive decorations. She bounced about the office, hanging up a wreath for the desk, some mistletoe for the door, and four stockings monogrammed with the street names of the team. She whistled cheerily as she went about her work periodically stopping to survey AR windows floating out from the nexus. I hate to bring down the festive atmosphere, but while I'm all for spending the avi getting minced on eggnog, I was under the impression that this was a business meet. Brianna shot a glare wildcard's way, a little bit miffed, give me my moment. Okay, wildcard? This is the closest a fixer gets to a holiday. Reminds me, commented Dervish, who had brought an entire six pack of cherry and coriander holiday beer upstairs with him and was currently working on the fourth bottle. Are you doing a Christmas party again like last year? Brianna positively beamed. I finally got the dining room at my house renovated, so I'll be able to do it properly this year, too. The roast turkey, the decorations you're invited, of course, and let me know if you're bringing guests. Right now it's mostly Abe and my other business contacts, but Damien will be stopping by, and Malcolm promised he'd bring his kids to play with my son. They sound so innocuous now that they're out of the game, shuddered Ben, Damien and Malcolm, law-abiding citizens, Damien and Malcolm, James Bond villain and flag pin wearing spider nutball, agreed Dervish, popping his fifth beer, Ben frowned at Dervish, are you gonna insult me when I retire, too? Wildcard shrugged, we do it now, you dandelion eating pots, Locke chuckled at Wildcard sentiment, prompting a complaint from Ben, hey, Azzy, show some respect. Locke looked at Wildcard with his mouth half open, looking for validation that Bend was being hysterical. Wildcard just shrugged and commented. Respect is important, newbie. Locke rolled his eyes and looked at a couple of passing AR windows, mostly detailing events in the corporate world. So, are there any good looking jobs on the market, Brianna? Well, Bend mentioned that the team still wants to gauge your skills, Locke, and I wanted to toss you something easy for the holidays, anyway. 
Locke looked over at Ben to find the tie-dye wearing infiltrator wearing a smirk. Which is why I've got a simple wet work job lined up for you. Ben's smile promptly disappeared. Wait, what? Brianna shrugged. It was the best paying job in its class. Ben, you used to be a ghost, you shouldn't have a problem with killing. Well, Buddhism suggests that conflict can have grave circumstances on one's harmony, and on top of that, killing is gross. It was Locke's turn to wear the shit-eating grin. My religion is fundamentally based around killing. Brianna nodded to Locke. Bend, you did say you wanted to get more of a feel for his skill set. Bend proceeded to grumble as he stole one of Dervish's beers. Hey, get your own six pack. The Johnson meet was at a steakhouse. On the class rating of steakhouses that the team was used to, it was on the lower end. Designer and formal suits were abandoned in favor of business casual, and classical music made way for country western. It was the kind of establishment that featured an eat 6 pounds of steak in one hour and you go on the wall challenge trolls need not apply. As the team was led to the Johnson party table by a chipper human girl wearing pigtails and a too tight to be classy blouse, Dervish made his intentions eminently clear. Guys, I'm doing the 6 pound steak challenge. Wildcard playfully punched Dervish. Not during the Johnson meet, giggles later. Come on, I'm 400 pounds of meat and supraathyroid, they won't know what hit em. Locke adjusted the buttons on his silk shirt and repeated Wildcard's ultimatum. Not during the Johnson meet, like a dejected child, Dervish kicked one of his white-toed sibber feet at the floor and grumbled. Johnson was a wiry elf with the callous knuckles and chin scarring of a life led hard. He apparently didn't believe in obscuring one's loyalties. The ugly tie he wore over his business casual monkey suit seemed distinctly chosen for its garish use of red and green. Johnson was an obvious ancient, through and through, which meant many things right out the bat. Johnson wasn't professional, Johnson wasn't classy, and Johnson would probably be okay with sloppy wet work. Without even waiting for anyone to order food, Johnson opened up with his pitch. I need you to kill a troll and his friends. Without skipping a beat, Locke responded. How many friends? At least two. Essentially, we want you to cripple a gang by killing all the movers and shakers. Dervish smiled despite himself, remembering a similar run so very long ago. Locke continued, let's hear a few more details before we talk price. Mr. Johnson, for all we know this troll could be X spec ups. Try XCon, counted Johnson, putting up an AR image of a large troll with titanium dermal deposits and an absolutely massive, over modified chrome cyber arm. This is curb stomp. Curb stomp was promised a cushy life if he stayed inside. Locke hazarded a guess. Curb Stomp didn't stay inside? No, he didn't. He made some friends and now he's in Puyallup, poaching our turf again. So you want him and his friends taken care of? Permanently. So who are these friends we're hearing so much about? We don't have surveillance and only orcs and trolls are allowed into the gang's compound but we've heard rumors about a war boss troll, mostly Bioware, a real Frankenstein job and a voodoo magician. Curb Stomp apparently got in deep with some Haitians while he was on the island and the hunger is their way of saying thanks. So we kill the boss, the warboss, and the hungan and we get paid? And any other gangsters that you'd care to kill, there's maybe 15 other regulars, mixed orcs and trolls. If you impress me there's always the chance of a bonus. No offense, Mr. Johnson, said Felix, leaning back in his chair, but professionals don't deal in chances. Johnson grimaced. Well, I do, and you can take it or leave it, 20,000 Nguyen. Try 40, Mr. Johnson, this is still wet work, even if it's ghetto trash. And with three powerful trolls I'm not liking our insurance. 20,000, Johnson's hard fast ahead and you can at least do 30. We do have lifestyles to uphold. I know that this is way below your professionalism grade, which means you're probably doing this as a test run of some kind and it's not about the cash. 20k. That doesn't mean that we don't like cash, Mr. Johnson. I'm going to have to move it up to 30 again. 20 and 5 up front. Locke looked around to see the rest of the team shrugging and looking complacent. Not my favorite figure, but it'll do. Johnson and Locke shook hands, and Johnson stormed off, looking like he had other business to attend to. Wildcard, Bend, and Locke all instinctively threw themselves to the floor and began reaching for their guns as festive music played in AR and streamers and confetti shot out of the ceiling. Two waitresses in branded t-shirts carried a platter with a truly preposterous steak over to the table and fastened a bib around Dervish's neck. As Dervish's teammates picked themselves up from under the table, Dervish announced. Meeting adjourned. 32 minutes later, there was a large picture of Dervish, 
his face stained with steak sauce, smiling for the camera. The nameplate read America Sam. Wildcard asked, incredulously. Are you happy, Dervish? Inordinately. Dervish gripped his stomach, moaning as he slumped into the back of Wildcard's turbica. So, asked Locke, how are we thinking of going about this? Dervish responded, with a wide grin. Well, this is below our pay grade anyway, so I figure it won't hurt to have some fun with it. Ben gave Dervish a sidelong glance. Define fun. This is a terrible idea, griped Locke, thumbing his binoculars as he and Wildcard sat atop the catwalks of an old, defunct Puyallup factory. Why aren't we leaving infiltration to the infiltrator? They catch him, they kill him for being an elf, rebutted Wildcard, whereas Dervish is appropriate for the environment. Consider it a part of legwork. We did enough legwork just paying off the trash around here to direct us to the crusher's hideout. Wildcard pushed his mask up on his face long enough to pop a cigarette into his mouth and light up, leaning over the railing. Patience, moaning Minnie. We get Dervish in there, we get a long look at their facilities and personnel, yeah? Locke sighed, paying careful attention to Dervish as the orc strolled fearlessly in bandana and armor jacket up to the scrap metal gate of the compound, I guess. I think we could probably handle them anyway, trolls or no. Wait a minute, is that, Bend, the innocuous seagull flying above the compound, found himself in a cloud of toxic gas and held his breath. This was normal for Puyallup. The fact that the gas followed and began giggling was less normal, but still believable for Puyallup. Smog spirit, called a deep voice from within the compound. Everyone load up. Bend cord in fear and peeled away as the trolls below began emptying futile magazines into the cloud of gas where he had been. In a panic, he called up one of his Buddhist air spirits, which just contributed to the clusterfuck before the smog spirit exploded. And that, said Wildcard, is why we weren't sending Bend in. In part to draw attention away from his teammate's gaff, Dervish promptly slammed his fist on the gate. A small viewport slid open. Who are you supposed to be, kid? I'm supposed to be the baddest astrog this side of Puyallup. You don't need to know why I'm here, just that I got services to offer to your boss Curbstomp. Curbstomp don't take no solicitors, bitch. Call me bitch again, son. Dervish's zipper blades slowly began sliding out of his fists and elbows. There was a minor commotion or argument behind the gate, and a much deeper voice growled. We were doing recruiting this week. You're half as bad as, as you say you are, you get the chance. Reason why you so up to get into the boss good graces, Trog? Dervish growled back. Cause Katana wielding Suzuki riding dandelion eaters are moving on my hood, and I need backup to teach them to back the fuck off, we solid? After a pause, the door swung open, revealing an orc and a troll in a strange hybrid of military gear and baron's rags, yep. We solid, just so happens we arming up to take on the elves, you do your part in the pit, you get your place in the gang, dervish cocked an eyebrow, the pit? The pit. Sitting up in their factory roof hidey hole, lock, wildcard, and bend paused over their professional grade surveillance tools and a pack of organo style popcorn. The pit? Dervish was ushered. Alongside about 20 other young orcs and trolls who appeared to be housed somewhere else in the complex from inside it turned out to be three ancient storefronts cobbled together with scrap and concrete barricades into a makeshift courtyard, into a concrete floored basement, pipes and rusted machinery ran along the ceiling and support pillars. Spattered patterns the off-brown of old blood ringed the room. A few dingy light bulbs supplied murky light down onto a thick crowd of orcs and trolls, cheering on and making room for two trolls beating each other senseless in the center of the crowd. At one end of the room were three makeshift thrones made out of broken machinery and car parts. In the center throne sat Curbstomp himself, looking on appraisingly as one of the two trolls finally grabbed hold of the other's horns and smashed him face first into the concrete wall. He was flanked by two other trolls. The troll on his right was dressed in a suit jacket over a bare chest with white skull mask face paint, covered in fetishes. The troll on his left was a vat job freak, his horns and dermal deposits replaced with super dense vat grown bone, and his muscles corded and taught to action figure specificity. These were, presumably, the targets. Curbstomp stood up, and loudly announced. All new blood rise for war leader Madden. The vat job stepped forward as the room calmed down into a frenzied muttering. The buyer bog announced. My name's Madden, but until you're in the gang, you can call me boss. I figure you all came here, you know what initiation is, so get to it. Everyone pick out the guy you're fighting. Only one of you gets to join the gang. The young gangers around Dervish all broke off and began making eye contact, occasionally pointing or shouting at someone that they thought they could take. Eventually everyone was paired off, 
Everyone except Dervish. Dervish just stood and pointed at Madden. The room went from energetic conversation to dead silence in a few seconds as everyone realized what had happened. Um, Dervish, asked Bend, over the cervicals, what the fuck are you doing? Dervish responded, simply, having fun. Nostrils flaring, Madden stepped up to Dervish. His vat grown eyeballs swiveled and focused on Dervish, dilated in rage and adrenaline. Who the fuck do you think you are, rookie? Bitch, I don't think, I know. I'm Garrett from the Redmond fucking Barons, and I'm not afraid of anything. Madden gritted his teeth and growled like a pit bull as curb stomp. In the back of the room, burst out laughing. Shit, Madden, are you going to take that? Dervish danced back and forth, his sober legs flexing. You gonna take that, Madden? You gonna throw that punch? Back at the hidey hole, a large buzzard carrying three new kit burger value meals with supersized sodas in its talons transformed back into bend, landing naked on the catwalk. Okay, I got the stuff. It started yet? Locke gestured wildly toward the vid screen. It's about to sit down. Madden threw the punch, and it came like a freight train, his synaptics blazing. Dervish tucked under Madden's arm as it flew over his shoulder like a shotgun blast, smashing the rookie behind him into the crowd, trailing blood. Dervish spun underneath Madden's shoulder and, utilizing his Sanger wire zero training even if blades were a no-no for this match, planted an elbow right into Madden's flank. The crowd roared at the impact. Madden's muscles were as dense as corded steel. It just so happened that Dervish's bones were about twice as dense as that. The troll staggered. Adrenaline pumping, Dervish's Sibiri cover slid into place as he yelled, You're mine now, bitch. With an animalistic roar, Madden spun, swinging his arm around in a brutal right hook. He moved faster than Dervish had anticipated, and Dervish caught the blow right in the chest, and then continued to catch the blow as Madden followed through with the punch. Literally carrying Dervish another 6 feet before Dervish fell off of Madden's fist and hit the ground, Madden followed up with a vicious stomp. But Dervish rolled out of the way. Madden laughed, happy to see Dervish flailing on the ground. It didn't last long, as Dervish rolled into a crouch, activated his skimmer discs, and promptly launched upward into a full body check to the troll's center of mass. Madden staggered long enough for Dervish to reach up and grab the troll's horns, before using the horns as leverage to lift his knee to Madden's chin. The blow imbalanced the troll further, and Dervish hopped off to the cheering of the crowd as Madden smashed into the floor. Of course, the metal human body can take a lot of punishment, especially an orged up orc or troll. Dervish dropped back into his stance, legs bent and elbows up, as Madden loomed over him once more. Madden swung both hands in a hammer strike. It was a bad move, especially as Dervish had positioned himself with a support pillar behind. As Madden struck the pillar, Dervish maneuvered in between Madden's arms and landed four quick, brutal elbow strikes into the troll's gut, knocking the wind out of him. Bloodied and bruised, Madden pulled his arms into her attempt to grapple, but Dervish ducked out of the way and landed a spinning right hook directly into Madden's jaw, loosening his tusks and knocking a few teeth loose. As the crowd whooped and cheered and Dervish's teammates kept a running commentary, Curb Stomp and his hunger looked at Dervish appraisingly. Madden landed a few punches on Dervish, but they were less focused than before, and typically grazed rather than impacted, and Dervish was able to counterattack with more ferocity each time. Eventually Madden reared back, curling his arm in an extremely telegraphed haymaker. When he threw the punch, it smashed through one of the support pillars with enough force to total an engine block, and the ceiling shuddered dangerously. However, Dervish was nowhere near ground zero of the punch. He was a good distance above it. Scaling the 12 foot troll like a ladder, Dervish grabbed onto Madden's horns once more, and flipped over his back, dragging the troll backward into an awkward limboing position. Before Madden could counter-attack, however, Dervish activated his skimmer discs, overclocked his super legs, and jumped, flipping back over Madden's shoulders and carrying him bodily by the face. Before ricocheting off the ceiling and riding his head straight down into the pavement, teeth and chunks of concrete flew out into the crowd and a few walks in the front row staggered with the impact. The cheering reached a deafening roar as Dervish stood up and kicked Madden's limp body over. The troll was out cold. Five new in each. It was a minute and a half said wildcard, sipping on his cola. Locke and Ben grumbled and tapped out transactions on their comlinks. As Dervish cracked his neck and rubbed his muscles, Curb Stomp stood and made his way for the circle, a wide grin on his face. Throwing out his cybernetic hand, he chuckled, Welcome to the gang, Garrett from the Redmond fucking Baron. The Hungan stepped forward to address the crowd. This doesn't mean any of you are off the chain, meet, get to fighting. The crowd roared. 
the team watched through Dervish's Sibiris as Curb Stomp walked Dervish around the main building of the complex, a mildly less dilapidated affair that looked to once have been a motel. Voodoo Boy Stalman made friends in prison. He came out with me. Big guy that you trashed his Madden. He still ain't woke up. Hulk is somewhere. With a Yora, a teenage troll leapt from the rafters into an attempted tackle of Dervish, and instead ended up bouncing and rolling along the ground. That's Hulk. He's the village idiot. Hulk stood and brushed himself off. His face was pockmarked with acne, and his voice cracked awkwardly. It was rather disarming for a troll. One day I ma be a shadow runner. Sure you will, Hulk. Curb stomped ran Dervish through a few more of the facilities a rec room with thread, a makeshift gym, and a bunch of bedrooms. Figure since you damn near killed my lieutenant, you get a room to yourself, so long as you put those crazy moves to work on some ancient pussies. After one more wave of recruitment, we're gonna move on the local chapter house. Slash and burn, you feel me? Oh yeah, I feel you. Curb stomp, grin dervish. Ancient's been on my shit list since before I was born. Good to hear it, said curb stomp. Dinners of seven. Hope you like fucking bean. Back at the hidey hole. Lock and wild card on up. Loading armor piercing rounds. Troll killing rounds. Ben slipped into his chameleon suit, resigned. So we're doing it tonight? Wildcard nodded, the lenses on his mask flashing with color as his smart link calibrated and connected to the tacnet. We got all the info we need. Floor plans, windows, entryways. And this is the best time to hit them, right when they're all recovering from recruiting. Locke grunted his agreement. He called up Azukotl, his fire spirit. What's the plan looking like? Wildcard. Bend and you maintain silent spells on the team. Bend opens Dervish's window. We take care of any curious guards. We get Dervish's shotgun and armor through the window. Locke follows, and they do the killing. Bend, you're back up, and I'll watch from outside. Pity it had to go this way, commented Dervish, over the subvocals. Curb Stomp made his choice. He isn't blind to the repercussions, eh? So let's make it quick and painless. As night fell on the compound, the mission began. With tactical monitoring from Wildcard, Bend and Locke slipped past the garden scale 10 feet up to Dervish's window, carrying Dervish's armor. Under a spell of magical silence, they armed up and coordinated entirely by Tacknut, entering Stallman's room first. Stallman had a spirit watching him, and it possessed his body to save its master. His eyes flew open, glowing with energy, as he shot flames at his two mil-spec suited aggressors. It wasn't enough, as Locke deftly counterspelled the effect, and then he and Dervish filled Stallman with enough rapid fire lead to leave the entire room perforated, bed feathers and bits of plaster strewn haphazardly amongst the blood. All of this happened in mere seconds, in complete silence, before the team confirmed their kill and moved on to the next officer room. Madden was laying in bed, awake but crippled, wheezing through broken ribs. Although he could do nothing to prevent his fate, he mouthed race traitor in the silence when he spotted the shadow runners, before Dervish elbowed him in the neck one last time, this time with the blade extended. Curb Stomp was next. Locke didn't even give him the chance to wake up before coating him in gouts of magma. His screaming and frantic flailing went unheard, like a macabre slapstick comedy act from a silent movie. As both runners unloaded into his burning frame, he danced to the wall and lay still. There's a little kid hiding above the staircase, commented Dervish. Don't kill him, he's done nothing wrong. Same with the new recruits, they're being housed in the next building over. Rest of the core gang is in the building near to the gate. We position ourselves at the windows we can probably take them all out. Roger, commented Ben Gecko, gripping up to Hulk's hiding place. Hulk was, mercifully, sleeping, although Ben hit him with knock eject just the same. See, this is why I don't like wet work. Dervish asked, cause it's nasty to look at? Nah, because a lot of the time you get to know the mark first. True that, sighed Dervish, as the team converged on the barracks that housed the rest of the regulars, reloading. Wildcard perched himself by the outside window while Dervish and Locke took the inside ones. Here's hoping the rookies get the picture and move on to something better. Bent countered, sarcastically, like shadow running, still better than offing a man for the point of his ears, counted Wildcard, before opening up on the bunk beds within. The room turned into a frenzy of flame and bullets in moments, and Locke and Dervish moved to bar the doors with debris from outside as the blaze grew amongst the crawling survivors. In mopey silence, Dervish put his hand under the large, scrap iron gate at the front of the compound, lifted it single-handedly, and led Locke and Bend outside. Wildcard returned to the car and started up the engine. 
Let's go get drunk on Mr. Johnson's money, sighed Dervish. Locke nodded, I'm down for that. As if to remind the team that all was not drearanish and depression, their fat 5,000 million paychecks came in right before Brianna McCreary's Christmas bash. It was a very large dinner party, especially once guests started getting invited. Brianna's son Daniel and 2D's kids Ariana and TR1GG3R sat at the children's table, playing with coloring books. The topic of the day was that TR1GG3R was cheating, because he was able to download pictures from the internet and trace them directly with his mechanical hands. The tiny robot countered that his sister and Daniel were merely jealous. While 2D himself and his very pregnant wife bounced around the party, catching up with old friends including a particular ghoul doctor in a hazmat suit. Geppetto showed up only very briefly with mob maven Rowena O'Malley on his arm and an escort of black suited bodyguards, made very distant greeting, and proceeded to handle some order of business by Kamlink, periodically daubing at his leaking eye socket with a silk handkerchief. Wildcard took Dr. Green to the party as a date, and the two of them shared sarcastic faux intellectual gifts a limited edition operation game for Green, and a tiny Malibu Barbie sedan with a souped up electric engine and a disposable Kamlink in the trunk for Wildcard. Wildcard also got to exchange gifts with his former fixer, Luca a home cooking set for a nickel-plated predator, and his old partner Belfast more decorative masks, both ways. Although only Luca could make the party Belfast being on contracted work during the holidays. Dervish formerly invited Sensei, and although he managed to get the old coot to dress up in a suit, he couldn't convince him to shave. Sensei spent most of the evening grumbling about how he never liked the shadow community because it was so fixated on appearances. But he lightened up once Brianna had convinced him to have some wine, and especially when Dervish showed him his Christmas gift, a pair of wicked catters fashioned after shark's teeth. Locke brought absolutely no one, and proceeded to move around the party getting increasingly drunker because he didn't know anybody. When the party game started, though, Geppetto didn't care to reprise his role on the team, allowing Locke a fair degree of fun. Ben brought Emily, although Emily spent most of the evening being intimidated out of socializing by the likes of Geppetto, Sensei, and John the Ghoul. The evening was, however, livened up when he opened an anonymous gift to reveal an armed pipe bomb wrapped in a ribbon and bow, which he, 2D, and Wildcard promptly scrambled to disarm. When the ticking stopped, a card fell out of the gift. Flitting to the floor, Bend picked it up, just making sure my favorite agent hasn't gotten slow. Merry Christmas. For Mick, Bend blanched at the card. 2D poked at him, angry that he'd had to put down his wine to defuse a bomb. Hey, asshole, what's the deal? You trying to kill us? Hardly, said Ben. Jordan Formick was my commanding officer back when I was a spy. Shadow Run Story Time 17N. So first off, I just want to say I got some really cool Shadowgun artwork sent in by Scuffers. Um, the Twitter is up on the screen there now, so like you know, if you want to check out some of the other stuff that they do, definitely go ahead. Um, also, um, it's kind of hard because since TD posted it on fucking TG, I've got really no way of forwarding any information to him. Unlike Sorry, where like you know he's got a website and an email and all that, like you know, so you can't actually get in contact so like you know like if anyone does know the fellow that actually did write the shadowgun story time please try and get this picture forward to him it'd be a little shame if we couldn't you know what i mean and i think it's really cool and you know it would be nice if the guy actually got to see it for himself you know especially seeing as this was written what back 2012 you know so it's pretty old now and like you know to still see even after like you know what like seven years that people are still really enjoying his story just as much as they were back then, you know? Um, I think that would be really cool. So if anyone could get in contact, definitely try and forward to him if you can, if it's possible. But no, I, I do love Darvish. I would say Darvish is my favourite character in Shadowgun. And for him to get, like, you know, his own kind of, like, episode of sorts, I really enjoyed that. But I don't know, I didn't really feel like the wet work. It kind of felt a bit dirty, you know? Compared to what the guys are normally up to, and I don't know, it, it felt like, oh, I don't know, like it felt a bit dirty, underhanded, you know? But look, um, I know it's been a wee while since I've done a Shadowgun story time, and I really enjoy it. It's probably my favourite story time that I like to do. So I'm going to try and really hammer it out, and I want to get it done within the next two months, if we're lucky, that is. Um, minimum, I really want to be doing this once a week, just because I've managed to finish the cold shoulder. Let's get uh, Shadowgun finished off, because 
I really has been just arsing about, and I'm really piss poor at keeping to a schedule. So, like, you're just going to have to figure me about that. But, like, as I say, hope you boys enjoyed. Hopefully get us done in the next couple, like, you know, months or so. There is only a few more parts to go, so, like... <laughs> let's just hope for the best and of course if you have any artwork at all um i'm not really active on twitter it's mostly the mods that i like you know mostly the mods on the discord are actually in control of my twitter for the most part so i don't really see it all that much so honestly if you want to get a hold of me you go gonna discord's the only one that i really am active on but if you send it to twitter i will eventually see it myself so if you have any more artwork i would love to see it i love a good bit of artwork i think it's really cool but like I'm 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 going on for too long. I'll see you boys later and hopefully the next shadow gun won't be too long away. So I've recently moved Nick Bairdia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. So I am an affiliate of NordVPN. If you have been thinking of getting a VPN with everything going on at the minute, NordVPN is offering 75% off a three-year plan. I have been using Nor myself for a few years now because it helps support a lot of the people I like to watch on YouTube and I think it's pretty cool they have let me become an affiliate. So check out norvpn.org forward slash nickbeardier and use coupon code nickbeardier for 75% off while the offer is on. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more!